Full? Leave it. I can manage. I thought that was supposed to be for Cecil. It bores him, I think. Don't worry. He'll grow into it. Partner needs to set the table. Perhaps you'd better take it to the attic just for now. There's plenty of space up there. All right. Excuse me, Reverend Masker, and I shall have to let them in now. May I have one minute, Dr. Bliss? Most certainly. What are you going to do about your precious clocks? Well... I'm giving a talk to the Horological Society. For money? Of course not. You can't just sit around here for the rest of your life, you know. I do know. May I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. Admiral Douglas had no right to stop your work. It was all that publicity about your divorce that gave him the chance. If you brought the matter to the attention of the Navy Board yourself, he would have no legal argument. You're saying that I should write to them? Write to Douglas first, hinting what you might, but um, giving him the opportunity to um, change his mind. But that would be blackmail. Precisely. I think that's rummy. Thus, Dr. Meyer's lunar tables allow the navigator to calculate his longitude at sea, making allowances for both refraction and parallax distortion, using simple trigonometry. They suggest that the longitude problem is finally to be solved by a clock, not a clumsy man-made device of spinning wheels and levers, but a celestial clock whose hands are the moon and whose numerals are the stars. A dial writ across the sky by the creator himself. What do you make of him? A lunatic and a serious one. Very good, terribly good. Thank you. My Lord Sandwich. Morton, you honor the society. I had thought you might be attending the opera again tonight. No, my lord, but rest assured, the opera will be visiting me. Congratulations, sir. Most interesting. Thank you, your lordship. The longitude prize is yours, then. My lord, I am, I hope, a scientist. Knowledge itself is my reward. Oh, very Mark. good. He has ability, that young man, but little sense. How long will it take to prove these tables? Oh, not so long, four years, perhaps. Can he beat the old carpenter? Harrison, he has lost his way. His third machine has defeated him. Or so the rumor has it. This society was created so that men of science might solve the mysteries of our planet. I would not wish to see the longitude prize stolen by a country tool maker. Did you find the paper of interest, Mr. Harrison? Well, I certainly enjoyed the Reverend's enthusiasm for trigonometry at sea. My lord, the moon may only be observed 20 days in every month. And then only when there is no cloud. It is not a practical solution for navigation at sea. Please forgive my son William, you know. But he is right, Mr. Harrison. The practical solution is what we all seek. Mm. Tell me, the society's clock, is it still adjusted by celestial observation? I believe it is, sir. Why is your watch wrong? No, my lord. It's almost right. Which is much more curious, don't you agree? William. Lord. Four seconds. Still no change, then. 
It's remarkable. Mr. Harrison, you asked to see me. Ah, Mr. Jeffries. I was hoping you might be able to do some work for me. I would be delighted. Could you make me one of these? I need the teeth to be set a little further apart. I have to do a sketch of the details. Yes, yes, that should be possible. Uh, would next week be acceptable? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Jeffries, your watch. Is there a problem, Mr. Harrison? No, no, I'm quite pleased with it. The modifications are encouraging. I want to make another. Must be a little larger, of course, to incorporate some more changes I have in mind. And I was wondering if you would consider assisting me. I would be happy to. Thank you, Mr. Jeffries. See you next week. What are you doing? I mean to make another. But the third is almost ready. We cannot afford to be distracted now. You've seen how the watchers performed in the test. It's not perfect. But what if I could make it so? What if I could make a timepiece no bigger than the span of a man's hand that could be taken to see? Now, wouldn't that be a practical solution? Harrison's fourth machine by reason alike of its beauty and its accuracy, must take pride of place as the most famous chronometer that ever has been or ever will be made. But the journey from his third machine, which you see behind me, to his fourth, thank you, is one of the most extraordinary mysteries of horology. Faced as he was by a seemingly insuperable problem of centrifugal forces, Harrison took a daring and lateral leap. It is as though an aeronautical engineer suddenly ceased development on a new aircraft and instead adapted the technology to make his bicycle fly to France. H4, as I've come to call it, resembles a large silver pair case watch, about five inches in diameter. Indeed, it seems to have been designed for the daily wear in the pocket of some Brobdingnagian. At the moment, it's not working. But that is a state of affairs that I hope very shortly to do something about. We should be finishing work on our third machine, not wasting time on this deck watch. Wasting our time? The machine is almost ready for its sea trial. Now, we've not had time to conduct a 28-day test on this watch, let alone three or six-month trial. I'll go when I'm ready. Another thaw. Then we need to apply for more money. We cannot survive any longer than what we have. Mr. Jeffries at least should be paid, even if we are not. Are you unhappy, Mr. Jeffries? Me, sir? No, sir. There you see. Mr. Gould. Sir. Francis Gray. I enjoyed your talk very much. I'm looking for people who can explain science in language that anybody can understand. Children, for example. Do you have any of your own? Two, uh, but we're separated. But not divorced? Oh, no. Oh, well, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Uh, next time you're in town, perhaps you'd care to come and see me. I'd like to talk to you about something. Certainly. Oh, good. Here's my card. Uh, you'll find me at the PBC. Mr. Harrison. Oh, Reverend. I think you know Captain Campbell. Captain